pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, I would like. I would like to report that all board members are present except Marty Hyen and Jim Green. Are there any agenda modifications at this time? Any agenda modifications? Alice? No? None. Okay. All right. We'll move on to the spotlights and there it's on hiatus for the summer. It gets a vacation apparently. So public comment related to agenda items and I'm given the signal there are none so that's good um, action items according to the agenda we have none okay we're now up to the adoption of the consent calendar are there any items on the consent calendar that we need to pull can we pull item 5b from the consent calendar we can 5b is pulled any anyone wish to pull 5a not seeing any all right all those in favor of accepting um, 5a adoption and appropriation of grant budgets please signify by saying aye aye, aye. All, any opposed motion passes okay personnel actions 5b you had a question or comment um, I have to declare a potential conflict of interest because my brother is getting hired at West Salem Okay, so anyone have any objections to Mr. Lippold voting on whether his brother gets a job or not? <laughs> <clears throat> Seeing no objections, it appears you can vote on your brother or not getting a job. Okay. <laughs> they never know how he's going to vote. All right, all those in favor of accepting the personnel actions as presented, please signify by saying aye. All those opposed signify by say, same sign. Oh, uh, can I go back? <laughs> I, I, I to the yes. <laughs> yes, the, mo the motion passes with okay. Jesse voting for his brother to get a job. So, okay. Uh, we have no readings tonight, uh, but we do now we're on monitoring report EL1. Superintendent Perry. All right, so. Uh, EL1, the global executive constraint, has undergone a major revision since we uh, talked about it in our work session last uh, month. And one of the comments I want to make is there were a number of external audits that I noted in this document. And as uh, Chair Kylo and I discussed, we thought a good way to keep you updated about the executive limitations was to provide some ongoing updates. So for example, uh, one of the um, topics is around the financial audit. Um, and we have an outside um, external auditing firm that audits us. And when that audit is finalized, I will put some notes in the next month's EL report and I'll refer us back to EL1. So that's how you'll be able to have that ongoing um, conversation and about some of those important topics to you. So we thought that might be a good way to see how that works. Um, so, and I'm not going to read all of these um, because you've had them in your packet, but we tried to outline the policies that we thought were relevant. Those are all on our website. We didn't bring them in for you. We certainly could at any time. Um, and then I put some places where I've done something that might be a little bit out of the ordinary. So for example, under uh, number one, the third bullet, um, just not that this is out of the ordinary, but I do oversee the um, any changes that go along with our mandatory training. And as an employee, I also take the mandatory training. So you can be assured that I, kind of, I know the content of it and I have to pass the test. But I also do a check-in once that's completed to see that we have all the sign-offs on the mandatory reporting. And in addition this year, 
uh, this past year, I really oversaw the uh, mandatory training for our employees that work with vulnerable students in our specialized classroom around the bathroom and toileting protocol. And I actually oversaw development of the training and to be sure that it was implemented across the system to the right employee groups because it's not a mandatory training for every employee group. Once I'm I am sure that's part of our system, then I will back away from that and it just becomes systematized. But I, I'm going to try to highlight some of those sorts of things that were differences in how we um, generally operate. Then um, under number two, uh, two types of audits we do uh, for ourselves. One, we have um, all kinds of legally required audits. And then the second bullet describes kind of our own quality assurance process and how we audit ourselves and have people come in to do that not legally required and again as we have those audits I'll bring some highlights forward to you in upcoming EL reports th so that you can ask more in-depth questions I didn't at this point go back to all of last year's I thought from this point for going forward that would be a good way to um, keep you in the loop of the ELs um, the other thing I thought was important to highlight on this report uh, one of the requirements of my license is um, the reporting of ethical violations to teacher standards and practices. Um, and because my license is tied to that, I have a requirement to report. I don't delegate that authority. I actually oversee uh, that. And so you can be assured that any licensed educator that has to be reported to TSPC, I've seen that. I know the case. I know whether it falls under a, a guideline to report or not even though the bulk of that work would come out of our HR department. So that's my kind of high level of some of these um, items and hoping that it gave you a bit more and different information. And I'll open it up for questions. Okay. Any questions for the superintendent? Any questions on the, this report? Any questions? Going three times. All right. The, the EL reports, uh, we do not vote on these, but we do agree to them by consensus. Thumbs up if you accept the report. Thumb to the side if you can accept the report and live with it. Or if you have objections to the report, then it's thumbs down. So, uh, thumbs up. Okay, it looks like we have consensus on accepting the report. EL1, thank you. Superintendent Perry, Executive Limitation 2. Uh, executive limitation two is emergency superintendent succession. Um, and um, I, this is a pretty straightforward report, but I have designated the assistant superintendent. In this case, it's uh, Kelly Car Carlisle to act on my behalf in my absence or in an emergency um, of any kind and I'm not available. The other thing you need to know is that the entire exec team actually helps in the operations of the district, and in my absence, it would be a team of people that operated the district. What you do need to think about um, is if something happens more tragically and you are looking at a replacement of the superintendent, you should really um, think in terms of what does our policy say around conflict of interest and so I've referenced that policy for you. And also important to note is that you'd have the support of exec administration or any executive team member in how you went about the selection of a successor superintendent. So that's my report, and let's hope we don't ever have to use it. Yeah. Um, any questions or comments about executive limitation two? All right, all of those in favor of accepting the report, thumbs up. Okay, looks like we have consensus on accepting executive limitation two. Thank you very much, Superintendent Perry. Uh, next item would be the preschool Head Start report. So I'm gonna call up uh, Stephanie Wetzel, and she is our uh, coordinator of our preschool programs in the school district. The Head Start report is actually a federally required report that you need to hear. Um, and you need to hear it twice a year. And a lot of times that report looks very similar from year to year, and you'll think I've heard this before. But tonight I asked uh, Stephanie, because we have new board members, to do kind of an overview of our preschool programs. And so that you can see that it isn't just about Head Start, it's about all of our preschool programs. And so that's what uh, Stephanie is here tonight to share. So 
Well, thank you. Let me see. Is this good, the sound? Perfect. Thank you for inviting me. I tell folks I do love to talk anytime I get to talk about preschool students. I love to talk about that. So thanks for letting me share just a little bit about our pre-K programs in Salem-Kaiser. So I just have a really short uh, PowerPoint uh, where I'll go through a couple slides and I believe you have them in front of you. Uh, the first one, see, there we go, is kind of a representation of our organizational chart. So if you look at it, looks at the different programs that we have available in our district. Um, I tell folks uh, when parents call sometimes and say they're interested interested in preschool, it takes a little bit of dialogue with them to figure out what program may be the best fit for them. So talking about the age of their child, uh, where where they're living, uh, kind of some of the qualifications of the different programs, but, but our hope is that we would have a fit for everyone. Uh, but depending on what program may be the best service for them. So that the first chart just gives you a little bit more information about the programs that we have available. And last year, um, with the programs that are here listed on the chart, we served about 975 students. Let's see. Uh, the next piece we're going to look through just a little bit of demographics and qualifications for the different programs. Uh, the first slide uh, talks specifically about our Head Start program. So our Head Start program in Salem-Kaiser School District, we serve 340 students. Um, so if you look at it, for Head Start, they ha uh, families have to be at or below the federal poverty guideline to qualify for the program. So it is income-based. Uh, we do have one of the highest waiting lists. So if you look at Head Start programs around the state, I think our program was fourth in, in the waiting list. So we have a high number of families, a limited number of space available, and we remained full you know, all year long for that program. Uh, this year with our Head Start program, any program that received funding through the Early Learning Division was required to do some work around equity. So our program uh, did an equity assessment and we worked with John Lenson and his team to come in and do some training for staff and looking specifically at access to programs and demographics of who we're serving and how does that compare to the population in our district and in our community. So if you look at um, there, Part of our work was just ensuring access, so making sure that all students uh, know about the program and have access to services and how we're doing that. Uh, let's see, our next slide looks at our Title I preschool. So um, this is funded through our title funds with Salem-Kaiser. Uh, the differences here is our title preschool program looks as for kids who are going to be entering kindergarten the following year. So these are kids, four-year-olds only, focused on kind of that school readiness piece, and we're targeting certain elementary catchment areas. So we work with our title office to figure out which are our kind of targeted neighborhoods that we wanna focus on and in increasing access and getting them uh, increased services there. Uh, the next one looks at our Preschool Promise program. Our next slide. That was a new program for us last year. So last year was our first year uh, pilot our implementation year. It is, uh, we had a small number of spots. So we had 40 students enrolled in the program. And for our Preschool Promise program, it's an extended hour. So the number of hours uh, for services has to match K-5 elementary instructional hours. Um, so we have an extended day for Preschool Promise. And families can make a little bit more money and qualify for the program. So families can make up to 200% of the poverty guidelines and qualify for services. Uh, see, the next slide just talks about a variety of other programs where you might see preschool students in our district. Uh, we have a teen parent uh, over at Baker School. We have a family literacy center. So we have teen parents who are doing GED and high school completion along with their kids who are coming with them in a Head Start classroom. Uh, we serve kids infant up to about three years old over at Early College High School with our teen parent early childhood center. Uh, we have a tuition-based preschool, so if families make more than I make too much to qualify for Head Start or Preschool Promise, we have a tuition-based preschool program that parents can choose to enroll in. And our goal with that program is to keep it below uh, cost of what they may pay out in the community. So for families who say, hey, I can't afford this, but I make too much for this, kind of targeting that group with our tuition-based preschool program. Uh, we have a migrant preschool classroom that's housed over at our East Salem Community Center. And then two of our high schools have an early childhood kind of C-Tech program over at West and at Sprague. I want to talk a little bit about recruitment. So part of that access and ensuring families are uh, hear about our services. So we do 
a lot of work in this area. Uh, we partner with agencies in our community, um, DHS, WIC, our hub, um, our elementary schools, other pre-K programs. Uh, but what we found is the best way to do that recruitment is really through word of mouth. So our parents are sometimes our best recruiters because hearing it, our families most of the time will hear about it and uh, through a friend, family, or neighbor. So making sure parents know to kind of help us spread the word with that. And um, we also did a few new things this year. So under the advertising piece, we've done a few things on social media. Um, our, we partnered with our Salem-Kaiser Transportation Department where they were able to put us a banner on a bus. So you may have seen the free preschool bus all around town. Uh, we also have some yard signs. Uh, people will call our office and say, are you guys the green signs that I've seen around town? I said, yes, we are. So we're excited that those are working. Um, so we've tried to do a variety of things with, with new methods, but then focusing still on the friend, family, neighbor, word of mouth that we know works with that. Um, so that's just a little bit about the variety of programs that we have available. Um, I wanted to invite one of our parents who's worked through our program just to give you a little bit of information about what her experience looked like with our pre-K programs. Um, she was a little nervous, but I told her it's great, it, great and she's going to do a great job. Uh, so I will introduce Adriana Gabriel Morales just to tell you a little bit about her experience with our pre-K programs. Sorry, I'm really nervous. <laughs> um, my name is Adriana Gabriel Morales, and um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself and my family's experience with the pre-K programs. Um, growing up in my family wasn't the easiest. My dad was deported when I was three, four years old, so he wasn't around. Um, my mom wasn't much around either. She had her own issues, so my grandma's the one who raised us but worked constantly. Um, when I got pregnant at 16, it was a big disappointment in my family to the point where my dad, when I had communication with me, with him, he stopped all communication and my mom was still absent. There was no room at my grandma, so I ended up having to stay with an aunt. 16, pregnant, no support from my parents, and I was, it was a hard pregnancy. I ended up missing a lot of school and just stopped going. And then um, when I was 18, I found out about the teen parent program at um, Chemeketa. I was married, pregnant with my second child at that point. Thankfully, I was able to graduate in 2013, a couple days before my 21st birthday with a four-year-old and a two-year-old. With, with, if there wasn't the teen parent program, I probably wouldn't have graduated. But thankfully, I was able to and I pushed for them. When I graduated, I enrolled my daughter with Salem Kaiser Head Start. She was accepted and able to continue her journey as she had already been going to school while I was at the teen parent program. If it weren't for Head Start, I would not think my daughter would be able to excel as much as she did. She went to kindergarten knowing how to spell her name completely, spelling my name, my husband's name, and my son's name. She was able to count to 200 and knew all her sounds and alphabets. She was picking things up like a little sponge. While my daughter attended Head Start, we also had the opportunity to work with Willamette Early Learning Service Department, Willamette ASD. Um, they came to her class monthly and worked with her alone and sometimes in little groups with other students. We set goals and she was accomplishing those goals monthly. We had monthly parent meetings, policy council, home visits with both teachers and family advocates as well. Family advocates are a major part of the Head Start program in order to better support our families and children. My son had entered Head Start and I was able to attend a Ready for Kinder class that was provided to our program thanks to the P3 grant. That gave many families opportunity to go and wonderful material and the teachers were awesome as well. Growing up in a broken home, I guess I learned many things not to do, but I also learned with our parenting classes many ways to help my children go. My dreams for them would be to continue school and do whatever makes them happy. I want them to excel and have everything that I didn't have growing up. I don't want to see my children fail, and as a parent, I am sure no one does. I only wish for the best for their futures. While my daughter was attending Head Start, I decided to apply with the school district. Soon after, I received calls for a couple different interviews and was hired with Salem Kaiser Head Start. I always wanted to work with children, and coming into this awesome program, I felt like things were starting to look up for my family. Being a full-time wife, mom, and Salem Kaiser Head Start employee had been a challenge, but a challenge I wouldn't change for the world. 
My coworkers are not just my coworkers, but more like family. Salem Kaiser Head Start is an awesome program that helps our families. It is not only a non-judgmental community, safe place for our families, but it's also a starting point for our next generation. Head Start years are important years for our children to start growing as individuals. Thank you. Well, she did a great job, and I, I knew she would, and I uh, can't follow that. But I did submit an, a couple reports just for information only. So if you, anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. Oh, Chuck? This might be more of a question for uh, Mr. Wolf, but uh, with the upcoming proposed bond measure, where does preschool fit in and, and uh, from a facility standpoint and, and uh, a growth standpoint? Well, that's a great question. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about the, the bond uh, this Saturday uh, in our session, but um, one of the aspects of the base bond proposal is a new elementary school that would be able to uh, house the Auburn population and then repurpose the Auburn Elementary School into an early learning center for the district. Do we know how many uh, additional preschool kids that will allow us to get off the waiting list? We haven't done any of that analysis, but we have plenty of time to work those issues. Yeah. Thank you. And some of the waiting list is a result of funding slots. So the Head Start is a certain amount of funding. So it's not just <coughs> facilities, it's funding slots as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the information. We have a revised calendar of dates. Um, so please put those in your calendar or in your reminder book or whatever it is you use. Uh, now it's time for public comment on non-agenda items, and we have two folks. Um, the first one is, well, what I'll say first is that you have three minutes to make your comments. If you have copies of materials, please bring them up, and we will be glad to look them over. At three minutes, you will get a very nasty look. You'll hear the bell. <laughs> um, you will be cut off. Um, so just giving you the warning. Uh, I believe there's a one-minute warning. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, the orange light is the one-minute warning. That is correct. And the red light is stop. Okay. What? Where's the red light? Right there. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, you'll see, you'll see this. Yeah, you'll see it. <laughs> first, uh, first person to uh, come before the board tonight is Christy. Is it Negri? Yes. Okay. microphone good here okay. thank you for letting me uh, address you this evening first of all I'm a mom of former Salem Kaiser students um, and they are all grown now I was an active parent participant when they were in school and I just want to start by saying how deeply appreciative I am of the people who were dedicated to getting them a good education they did they did a great job the, their experience was great today I'm here representing the Salem Kaiser unit of the NAACP I'm chair of the legal redress committee and I'm joined by another member of the executive board Tom Surmat um, over the past years our leadership has worked closely with the district superintendent and others in the administration on issues affecting the students of color in our district and as you on the school board are aware the graduation rates for african-american students in this district are poor compared to other groups we're very much appreciated the willingness of Superintendent Perry to listen to our concerns, very much. We especially applaud the creation of the Director of Equity position and the appointment of Cynthia Richardson to fill that position. The African American student population is broadly dispersed throughout the district and creates a unique challenge in reaching them and their families in ways that can boost academic success as a group. The appointment of Ms. Richardson is a much appreciated start, but it is only a beginning. It is no secret that students do better when they see people in positions of leadership who, to put it simply, look like them. Why should any student of color believe in a future where they have the opportunity to excel by their merits when the authority figures in their life are all white? 
In Salem-Kaiser, we have a minority majority. Let me put that another way. There are more students who are not white in our district than there are students who are white. Yet last year, we made changes to 16 principal positions, and now this year, another 20, and not one of the new principals in the district is African-American. Not one. Out of 65 principal positions, we have one African-American principal, and that is at, at an elementary school. Yes, we created a position for Ms. Richardson, and in that pro process, because she was only one of two, we lost 50% of our African-American principals. This situation's not okay, and I believe that since we recruit people from outside of the district, if we were committed to filling these positions with more African-Americans, more people of color, we could do it. So my, I understand this is a complicated issue in a complicated world, but ensuring that there's diversity in positions of power in our schools, both with teachers and administrators, that is reflective of our student demographics is a step that district can take to make a difference if we are committed to this cause. I appreciate your time. I, I thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Tom Cermak, did I pronounce that correctly? Oh uh, yes, you're on Tom Cermak. Okay. My name is Tom Cermak. I'm also with the Salem-Kaiser NAACP and I am the uh, chair of the Political Action Committee and uh, like Ms. Negri, I'm here to address the issue of hiring of, uh, or the repositioning of principals. And I wish that uh, Ms. Negri and I had coordinated a little bit better because she said most of what I wanted to say. Uh, I did notice that uh, we have 20 uh, principals who have changed positions, who are either newly taking positions here, only one of whom came from outside the district. Uh, we are aware that the, uh, the board is committed to uh, a, an effort in recruitment to establish diversity, but, and I, I, I hope I'm preaching to the choir here, we, uh, when you draw from the same homogeneous pool, you don't get much diversity, and bringing in only one other person from outside the district, I would suggest, is uh, cause to uh, look again at, at the, proceeding, the process that, that is in place. Uh, and to echo somewhat what Ms. Negri said, uh, when you are a person of color and you uh, go through a school system, uh, and we, we recognize that uh, the, the uh, uh, dropout rate is lowering for most minority groups, it is three times the level for African American students as it is for white students, and for all but uh, one or two other minorities, it is also too large. Uh, there is a a, a psychological benefit to being able to look at the persons who are your administrators, are your educators, and see faces of color. Uh, it is an inspiration to them to continue their education. Uh, and I would, we, we urge the, the, uh, the board and the recruitment effort to uh, increase those efforts to, to get more people of color in positions of, of uh, prominence, both because they can bring new ideas, how to address the problem of minority dropout, and they can also uh, inspire our young students to, to go for the goals that we hope they all wish to achieve, as did that young lady that, uh, that uh, addressed us earlier. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, I, no other names are on the list, so moving on. Um, any board members wish to report on any activities they participated in in the past week or the past two weeks? Anyone attend any graduations or anything that they would like to report on? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, Kathy. Yeah, so I was fortunate to go to the summer district graduations at North Salem High School. And I just happened to have graduated from North Salem. That's my alma mater. And it just gave me a really wonderful, warm feeling to see these kids line up and come up and get their graduation certificates. Yeah well worth the time spent. I'd recommend anybody go to that. They would enjoy it. Okay. It was hot, too. <laughs> it, was, it was hot. Sharon? So I had the honor of um, visiting the open house of the, um, the house that the CTEC students built this year. And my understanding is it's the second house? second house and it's built right next door to the first house that was built and they are both amazing beautiful I was hoping I could move in but said I had to pay pay mortgage on it so um, <laughs> but it was absolutely incredible and the students were there 
they gave us tours, they told us about their program, they looked you in the eye, they shook your hand, they were absolutely incredible students, so it was, it was a lot of fun to attend. And the thing that um, I found the most appealing was one of the students told me that they have 30% women in the um, residential construction program, which is, I think, six times higher than the national average. And the students that I spoke with, three were going on to engineering and one wanted to be an architect. So it was amazing. Great. Any, Mr. Lee? I too had a chance to go to that open house and it was good to see uh, so many kids there. Uh, very, very proud of their work and uh, they should be. It was uh, really kind of an exciting uh, project. Also, uh, this is something coming up. I just wanted to call to uh, people's attention, but uh, every August, uh, August 29th this year, uh, the Kaiser Chamber of Commerce has a special event for the Kaiser uh, Elementary, Middle School, and High School teachers and staff uh, at Kaiser Rapids Park. They provide them with a free lunch and just a way of saying welcome back and uh, thank you for all of the work that you do for the kids in the Kaiser community. So I believe that starts at 11.30 on the 29th and it's at Kaiser, uh, it's at Kaiser Rapids Park uh, in Kaiser, just off Chamawa Road, if anybody would like to go and okay. have a free lunch and, and uh, see our teachers. Great, okay. Jesse, anything to report? No. Okay. And I would just echo that uh, the uh, house build, the house build and the graduation both were very warm and uh, both very nice events. So, okay. Superintendent Perry. All right, just a couple comments. Uh, we did um, have 46 kids, students, not all of them walked last week, but 46 received their high school diploma. So they are uh, 2017 high school graduates. They don't count, they count in our four year. Um, so they're they get to say whether the class of 2017. We also had five students from Roberts complete their GED, so we had a total of 53 completers with our summer school programs this summer. So that's a nice um, thing. The, the very nice thing for those families is that they get to see their kids walk. So um, thank you to the coalition since they're here tonight. They uh, got to work with some of our teachers and increasing their Spanish fluency this summer. And this is this quiet little partnership that they just have worked diligently with, with our um, uh, recruitment department and human resources with Steve Nelson. And um, all reports are it was a fabulous first run at helping some of our local educators increase their Spanish without traveling far. So thank you uh, for that work. Um, and I think uh, that's uh, the end of my comments. Okay. With that, I believe we are adjourned. Uh, the executive session will begin in five minutes. Please. Here and we or will there? be in here. Okay.